And I'd like to actually ask Dr. Francesca Morgante, please, to come to the stage. I'll just move around. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really, really happy and honored to be here, thanks to Monica, to Andrea, for uh, having invited me and uh, give me the possibility to uh, speak about this powerful tool that is deep brain stimulation that you'll be heard about that in children this morning, but we can also use it in adults with uh, dystonia. Uh, let me just introduce myself. I'm a neurologist. I'm Italian, but I work in St. George's Hospital with Professor Edwards starting three years ago to set up a service for deep brain stimulation. And uh, the first question that I think that you want to ask me is uh, for which type of dystonia? Because a year you can see in this room the complexity, the heterogeneity of dystonia, how much everybody looks different from one another. So who is a candidate for this procedure? For sure, generalized dystonia uh, that usually onset is in childhood, but don't forget that uh, some of people with dystonia might have generalized dystonia with onset also in uh, late, uh, adult, uh, late childhood or like early adulthood. So we can have adult with uh, generalized dystonia. Usually generalized dystonia in adults have a very prominent component in one body district, and then there are other body districts that are affected. And these are very good candidates for DBS because uh, they spend all their life asking uh, about uh, a symptom that maybe can be very vague, like for example, they might have cervical dystonia and just cramps in their legs. And their, legs, their cramp in their legs is maybe a manifestation, a subtle manifestation of dystonia. The other indication in adults is a segmental dystonia. So when dystonia is affecting uh, at least two contiguous body parts or even focal dystonia when it's very severe, like very severe cervical dystonia. But um, the requirement is that uh, dystonia must be refractory to medical treatment. So here is the key, because what does it mean refractory? Unfortunately, um, differently from other uh, indication of the brain stimulation, for example, the brain stimulation is very much used in Parkinson's disease, and we have very clear criteria there. But for dystonia people, uh, defining the concept of refractory, it's really very difficult, because what makes dystonia refractory to treatment uh, is that a dystonia that does not improve at examination from a neurologist, or is uh, rather dystonia that is treated with botulinum toxin, but still that person have a poor quality of life. I would rather consider this criteria, in which uh, refractory dystonia is a dystonia that uh, still being treated with botulinum toxin have poor quality of life. And poor quality of life is made of many things. It's made of abnormal movements, it's made of lack of confidence, it's made of pain, pain, is made of stigma because of the disease. Uh, so again, factors that are impacting on quality of life in cervical dystonia especially, that is the main indication for DBS in adults are many. So as I told you, abnormal head posture that is not corrected by botulinum toxin, it's uh, and in a factor that is contributed negatively to quality of life. Severe pain, pain is one of the, mo the, the most frequent indications. So when we have cervical dystonia with very prominent pain, despite botulinum toxin treatment, and that pain might affect sleep, and sleep is very important because if you spend those eight hours that you should sleep in pain, you don't sleep, and then your uh, function during the morning is really bad, you cannot work, or your daily activities are disrupted because of pain, and you get depression because of pain. Also, another factor that is uh, impacting negatively on quality of life is head tremor. Uh, some people might have very prominent head tremor, and this is uh, uh, both socially disabling and also functionally disabling. And uh, as I told you before, Poor quality of life is made also of stigma or lack of confidence or difficulty to work. So uh, unfortunately, in the medical literature, there is not an established way to uh, consider this factor in adults with dystonia, but 
Uh, consultant that work with uh, complex dystonia cases, this should take in consideration, or at least I make my decision on offering this very powerful treatment based on this, uh, uh, on, on this criteria. So how many adult people with dystonia are candidate for DBS? It is unknown. Uh, it's amazing how like, we have been using this technique at least for the, fi the, la the last 15 years, but still we don't know uh, the percentage of people that have adult dystonia they can be a candidate, uh, neither like in people with cervical dystonia that are the most frequent candidate. What we know now, we just recently know that about 30% of people with cervical dystonia in an American study, so that reflect America and the United States, discontinue from botulinum toxin. We don't know why they discontinue. Maybe they discontinue because it's ineffective. Uh, so maybe 30% is a too much large figure, but some of them might require DBS. The reason why we don't know, because as I told you, we lack specific criteria for deep brain stimulation in focal and segmental adult alternate dystonia. And again, and this is the thing that we need to work as a community of neurologists. Unfortunately, people with cervical dystonia, especially them, uh, they are often um, underdiagnosed. I mean, like the estimation of the disability, it's underestimated how much is disabled a patient with cervical dystonia. Because unfortunately, our assessments are very short. If we assess people just in the resting position when sitting on a chair in a disease that's basically affecting movement, we don't get the sense how much disabling the be that condition. So we really need to work to train young neurologists to recognize the disability of dystonia to answer this question. So what we do, it's very simple. We insert uh, an electrical wire in the brain, and this wire is connected to a praise maker that is uh, uh, just uh, put uh, inside the skin under the clavicle. And it's like uh, this is a brain pacemaker, and uh, where we put this brain pacemaker, this electrode, uh, the most frequent target is the globus pallidum pars interna, what we call GPI, but also uh, there are other groups uh, like, um, around the world that have been using other targets like the thalamus for tremor, and more recently the subthalamic nucleus. So it's a wire in the brain and uh, is based on the uh, rationale that in dystonia there is an impaired firing in the brain in this structure that we call the basal ganglia that are involved in uh, organizing movement preparation and movement execution and that that deep brain stimulation somehow restore the abnormal firing. Although we don't have much more data about the mechanism of action. So this is the electrode. So this is a, a typical electrode that uh, have four contacts, sometimes have uh, even eight contacts, and what we do, we do the neurosurgery. So I always explain to my patient that the neurosurgery uh, is just the first step. It's a very difficult one, must be done by somebody that is very knowledgeable about the technique because uh, we need to go to target. So if we are wrong and we go in the wrong target, uh, that surgery may be very, very unsuccessful. But there is a second actor in this story that is the neurologist. And this is just a partnership between neurologist and neurosurgeon. And what does the neurologist? The neurologist is like, as, as an electrician, is the electrician of the brain. And with this little machine, we can change different parameters of the stimulation. We, can, we need to understand which is the site to stimulate. We need to understand which amplitude of the current, how much big should be this current, the frequency of this current, if we should activate two sides, three sides, one side. So there is much more to do. So we call that, we use a French word actually that is reglage. So it's a really, really give you the idea. So reglage is the process so which we select the best site with less side effect and better effect. And other question that I expect from you, are there any adverse effects to DBS? Yes, they are. We need to be very honest with people. We, don't need, we need not to push too much high the expectation. I always say to my patient, here you have an opportunity. Not all people with dystonia have that opportunity, but if you have that opportunity, you need to know what you are going through. So we might have intraoperative adverse effect. Bleeding is the most harmful one, can be very rare. In dystonia, just a recent study came out just recently, and as compared the 
frequency of bleeding in dystonia compared to Parkinson's disease. And uh, those two group of patients with, treated with the brain stimulation have a different frequency of bleeding. It seems that dystonia patients have a lower frequency of bleeding compared to Parkinson. Maybe because there is no ongoing neurodegeneration, so their brain is less fragile. Infections, so we can treat infection, we can treat with antibiotics, but sometimes we need to take off the system or we need to remove the battery or to take off all the system. It's very rare, uh, but we need to face this. And if we have an infection, we have to be aware that uh, you are uh, on the hand of a team that knows how to do, that have a plan to manage that. And then there are device-related complications because we are inserting something into the body that uh, it's uh, something that is extraneous to the body. So that is a, a very, very sophisticated computerized system. So a wire can be broken, the electricity cannot be delivered very well. And again, like electrician, sometimes we can even like adjust this uh, side effect. So which are the benefits? I want to thank Lucy for allowing me to show her video. And now looking to her, I really forgot how much like, she was like disabled by dystonia. So before DBS, you can see she couldn't even turn the head to the right, and she had a severe pain. So the reason that uh, led us to consider with her, because this is a joint decision. It's a decision we do together. and. The, we set some goals, and uh, when we stay there, and we, we had that first assessment, it was not my first assessment, but the first one, I asked to her, okay, but which are your expectations, which are your goals? So she wanted to turn her head. That's simple, such a easy thing to do. It's an automatic behavior we do, but in dystonia, in some dystonia people, it might be very challenging. If you cannot turn your head, you cannot drive properly. Uh, one of our patients started to drive again, for example, after DBS. If you cannot turn your head, that reminds me of a patient of mine that when she goes to the cinema, she has always to sit in a certain position. That really affects a lot your confidence, like of a young person that, you know, is looking for a partner, somebody to share the life with. It's really, really, really overwhelming. And also, the other factor was pain. And you can see, like, basically, the, the possible benefit. So there is a reduction of dystonic posturing, there is a reduction of dystonic movements, destruction of tremor, of pain and improve quality of life. I'm showing you the best, the best case, because you know, something that we do as doctors also at conference, we show us always our, our best case, but it's very honest from us to say that sometimes DBS in Estonia might fail, and why? And we really don't know very well. Maybe sometimes uh, something related to disease, so disease-related factors. We know that some genetic mutation for dystonia, especially that occur with dystonia in childhood, they uh, cause failure of DBS, so that they don't respond very well to DBS, whereas uh, other mutations respond very well. Um, there are few dystonia that are progressive because they have an underlying neurological disease that is progressive, so that is not the best dystonia to treat. Or, for example, if there are other signs, like in people with cerebral palsy, like spasticity, that is stiffness, is very prominent. This is not a sign that is improved by DBS. Or if we have brain lesion in the brain, that is not predicting sometimes a good outcome. But also, this is very important. That's why it's really a teamwork. You might have side effect due to the stimulation because your wire, your electrical wire, didn't go correctly in your target. Or maybe because you require too much high energy to correct dystonia, and this is very important to consider, and this is important for all people undergoing DBS, and clear goals of DBS are met expectation. And this is the worst, because if people do not have before DBS and uh, clear goals, this is a failure always. So good selection, good outcome. So in conclusion, I don't know if I can answer some of these questions. So is this BS effective to treat adult or dystonia with poor quality of life? I can say yes, if it's properly done. Does quality of life improve after successful DBS? Yes, if it's properly done. Pain improve. Rare, there are side effects intraoperatively that are rare. And uh, I think that uh, there is more to come because we are still can improve our way of delivering DBS in different type of adult 
out at Estonia. And it's just to uh, thank our wonderful team in St. George's, but most of all, our patients that really, really taught us a lot about Estonia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank So, Dr. Boganta, you actually, you covered a lot of, I think, what people are going to ask you, second-guessing them, but maybe let's throw it out to the delegates and see, are there any further questions, whilst, again, you have the expert on the stage here? And again, if I can ask you to put your hand right in the air and speak when, once you've got the microphone, please. Thank you. I was diagnosed with Meg's syndrome last August, um, but I've got MS as well. Um, when I had the MRI scan, it showed that I had no new brain lesions in my brain to show that, there was a, that the MS was active. Does that mean that this uh, Meg syndrome couldn't, isn't connected to my MS? Works. Is the microphone yeah, on? Yeah. Yep. So it's very difficult to answer this question not having evaluated your case, but uh, we uh, evaluate people with MS that have tremor and uh, they need to have DBS for tremor. And uh, uh, sometimes some of these lesions can be responsible for that clinical appearance. And, and anyway, uh, when you have active lesion, and I was, think, I was talking about that, this is one of the reasons why we shouldn't uh, treat with deep breast stimulation these people because you have an ongoing process that needs to be treated with this primary disease to see how this primary disease is responsible for that clinical manifestation. Right, okay, thank you. Gentleman at the front. So once DBS is implanted, do we require any maintenance or does it goes lifetime. Once the DBS is implanted, it's there. Once the DBS is there, uh, is there any maintenance? Is there any con <laughs> okay. other than configuration? Okay, Sorry. so again, when it's, when it's when it's very well, when everything goes right, usually there is a pathway for that. So uh, we see uh, in the first three months, patient at, at, at least every month, but then when the system is set, uh, we can see patient even every six months, and after the first year, also once a year. Uh, but uh, the system had to be checked for a battery life. There are rechargeable batteries, and there are not rechargeable batteries. Uh, but usually most of the examination are uh, close to the surgery to set the system and then uh, if the system is properly working in the Estonia patient really, really needs uh, two or one consultation per year. Nothing with respect to the device, you don't need to do any uh, re-implantation, nothing on the device, right? Okay, so no, we, you don't need to reimplant wire unless uh, you, re you consider reimplanting wire when you remove the wire because of an infection or when your wire is not very well positioned and your therapy is not delivered very well and uh, uh, the neurosurgeon and the team consider if it's worth reimplanting and you might reimplant. It's a very rare possibility, but that is a bit described and the people has improved after that. Thank you.